These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Judging by modern popularity, the most popular thing to come out of the temples of ancient Mesopotamia is definitely the goddess Ishtar. She shows up in popular media, in YouTube videos, in role-playing games, in occult stuff, and from what I've seen of the neo-pagan movement, she's probably the most popular Mesopotamian deity among those actively practicing and reviving the old faiths. And why shouldn't she be popular? She's strong and sexy. She takes initiative and stirs up trouble. She is, in a word, passionate, and we all admire passion. We took a look at her way back in some of the earliest episodes of the show, but honestly, there's just so much Ishtar stuff out there that it's high time for another look at the passionate daughter of heaven. I did some retellings before, and I do think that retelling tales can be very good for getting these stories contextualized for a modern person to understand. But I also think that sometimes it's good to read things directly, just how the ancients would have heard them, except, you know, translated into English. I'm not going to sit here and read you 30 minutes in Akkadian. That might be fun, but probably not. And so today is mostly going to be a lot of direct text from ancient Mesopotamia, all of it from Benjamin R. Foster's fantastic collection, Before the Muses. And if you're the type of person who wants over 1,000 pages of translated Mesopotamian texts in every genre, let me tell you, Before the Muses is one of the best books you can pick up. I'm not being paid by Benjamin R. Foster or really anybody, but uh, I'm just saying it's a great book. I will, as always, be modifying the text ever so slightly to make it a bit more readable and plaster over the missing portions of the text. It's a bit easier to see them when you're reading and a bit harder to hear them when you're listening. Uh, so it's going to make it a bit more readable, but this will, for the most part, be the things that ancient Ishtar worshippers had to say about their passionate goddess. Our first story today is something I've been trying to fit in the show for a while now, a story from the time of King Hammurabi called the Agusha Poem. This is divided into ten parts, and appears to have parts that would have been read by something very much like a classical Greek chorus when performed, and quite possibly would have been the background to some actors running around on stage acting out the events. Agusha is another name for Ishtar, as is, by the way, Ernina, and these alternate names do get dropped as if everyone in the audience is familiar with all the many alternate names and all the various meanings that these titles indicate. But with that in mind, the story is pretty straightforward, beginning as usual with a praise hymn to the goddess. Let me praise the greatest one the warrior among the gods. The daughter of Ningal's might and fame, let me extol. Ishtar, the greatest one, the warrior among the gods. The daughter of Ningal, let me tell of her might. Her grandeur is manifest, her ways hard to fathom. She is always in battle, cunning is her stratagem. She dances around gods and kings in her manliness. She is preeminent of goddesses. The praises of Ishtar let me sing. She holds in her grasp all divine authority. She bestows it wherever she wills. Ishtar holds in her grasp the lead line of the peoples. Her goddesses heed her command. Young men are hacked off as if for spear poles. There is a certain hero. She is unique. Ishtar is surpassing. She knows how to smite down. Her celebration is the melee, staging the dance of battle. She comes to grips with heroes, taking none by the hand. She leads off with the most valorous. Ishtar's celebration is the melee, staging the dance of battle. She comes to grips with heroes, taking none by the hand. She leads off with the most valorous. Frenzy in battle, passion in strife, were shown forth as her portion. 
The royal scepter, the throne, the tiara are given to her. All of them are her due. He, the father of the gods, An, bra gave her bravery, fame, and might. He surrounded her in abundance with lightning bolts flashing. Once again he added to her uncanny frightfulness. He has made her wear awesome radiance, ghastliness, valor. As for her, she felt that valor. In her heart she schemed battle. In the dwelling of the leader Ea, look out for her terror. She is more fearsome than a bull, her clangor like its raging. In her might she set forth, turning not a hair. At her uproar, Ea, the wise god, became afraid. Ea became enraged with her. Hear me, great gods, Ishtar is wary. And much is lost in this speech, but Ea is still speaking when it picks up let her be trusty, let her have muscle, let her raise riot, be always ready to fight. Let her be fierce, let her hair be extraordinary, more luxuriant than an orchard. Let her be strong of frame, let her complain, she must be strong, she must gasp for breath, for she will not tire. Let her not hold back her cry, day nor night, let her rage. The gods assembled, debated, they could not do it. They replied these words to the later leader, Ea. You are the one suited to do these things. Who else could bring about what you cannot? He heeded the words, they answered him. Ea the wise scraped out seven times the dirt under his nails. He took spit in his hand. Ea the wise created Saltu whose name means discord. God Ea has straightway set to his task. He is making Saltu that she fight with Ishtar. She is powerful in her form, monstrous in her proportions. She is artful as none could rival. She is a fighter. Discord is her form, monstrous are her proportions. She is artful as none could rival. She is a fighter. Her flesh is battle, the melee her hair. She is surpassing, she is fierce, she has extraordinary strength. Saltu is girded with combat for clothes. Her clamor is born of a deluge. She is strange, terrifying to behold. Raging, she takes her stand in the midst of the depths. The words that come from her mouth go round about her. Ea the Lord made ready to speak. To her, to Saltu, whom he created, he says, Keep quiet, listen, pay heed to what I say, hear my orders. What I tell you, do. There is a certain goddess whose greatness is surpassing beyond all goddesses. Strange and cunning is her handiwork. Her name is Ernina. She is mighty in male. Why he uses this alternate name for Ishtar, I don't know. But Ernina is related grammatically to snakes. The Supreme Lady, the Capable One, daughter of Ningal, I have created you to humiliate her. In my cleverness, I gave you your stature, valor, and might in abundance. Now be off, go off to her private quarters. You should be girded with awful splendor. Bring her out, you there. She will rush out to you. She will speak to you. She will demand. Now then, woman, explain your behavior. But you, though she be furious, show no respect to her. Answer her never a word to ease her feelings. What advantage shall she have of you? You are the creature of my power. Speak out proudly what is on your tongue, and as much again before her. Well, now Saltu has taken her stand, while Ea in the midst of the depths, gives her might. So Ea, the extraordinary of form, dispatched Saltu, drove her to insults, contempt, calumny. Ea the wise, whose reasoning is extraordinary, goes on to put yet a word right to her feelings. The sign of Ishtar the queen he gives her. It is Ishtar indeed. She is braver than all the other goddesses. He makes known to her her grandeur. He well described to her that prideful self. This lest she avoid her later. 
She is a divine princess. Her commands are mighty. She is the mistress whose way none has barred. She is surpassing. We know she is unique in herself. She is grander than you are. Stir no step abroad. Her fury and anger, like the welling up of the sea, will overcome you. Your speech will fail you. Inscrutable are the ways of the capable mistress of the people. And then Saltu flew into a rage. Her face altered horribly. She turned, and what happens next is lost. When it picks up, Nin Shibur, the divine servant of Ishtar, is giving commands to someone, saying, Come now, give a command. Prepare for a confrontation. In this way, measure the signs of her strength. Find out all about her. Learn of her haunts. Bring me her signs. Recount to me her behavior. The giver of orders, the tried and true Nin Shibur. She says these to the wise, strong hero. He, the hero who went out to the depth, he alone went to face Saltu. He looked twice when he saw the exceedingly great one. He fell silent. He examined her form. And interestingly, at this point, there is an odd grammatical inclusion a bonus wedge in some of the words that the translators think might be meant to indicate that the speaker is stuttering in terror when he gives the following report. She, she is bizarre in her actions, says the hero. She behaves unreasoningly. In her form, she is mighty. She makes many cries for battle. She is adorned with awesomeness. In her onslaught, she is terrible. She is murderous, bully, and vicious. And so did Ishtar learn Saltu's sign. Angrily, the most capable of the gods, the all-powerful, took the sign of Saltu proudly in her might. Fiercely, she drew herself up. The warrior Ishtar, the most capable of the gods, the all-powerful. Proudly in her might, fiercely, she drew herself up. In her greatness, she grinds up her enemies. She turns not back. She is the greatest among goddesses. She is energetic like a young man. She says a word. Proudly she speaks. These are the signs of her might. The two then come to battle in a conflict so intense that it damaged the very clay tablet that it's written on. Ishtar used her own personal power, plus her knowledge of Saltu's signs and mannerisms, to triumph, using wisdom to defeat the chaotic force of unrestrained violence. However, she's unable to kill Saltu for whatever reason. After the battle, Ishtar confronts Ea, and now, using the name Agusha, meaning the capable lady, says to Ea, why did you create Saltu against me? Who is the product of your mouth? What could have been your intention? Don't you know that the daughter of Ningal is unique? You made her enormity. Saltu has set her clamor against me. Let her return to her lair. Ea made ready to speak and said to Agusha, hero of the gods, As soon as you said it, then I certainly did it. You were driving me to it and caused delight at your having done with this. The reason Saltu was created is that people of future days might know about us. Let it be yearly. Let a whirling dance be established among the feast days of the year. Look about at all the people. Hear them clamoring in the streets. Let them dance. See for yourself the intelligent things they do. Learn now their motivation. As for the king who has heard from me, this song, your praise, the sign of your valor, Hammurabi, in whose reign this song, this my praise of you was made. May he be granted life forever. Let me praise Ishtar, queen of the gods, Agusha's might as the capable lady. As for rapacious Saltu, strange of splendor, whom Ea the leader created, the signs of her might he made all the people here. He has made her fair of glorification. He has made her fame worthy of her. 
and the lioness Ishtar quieted. Her heart was appeased. So, all that great battle with the monster Saltu, just to make Ishtar calm down a little bit, and also for the sake of being famous. As much fun as stories are, though, they appear to make up only a small fraction of how ancient people actually interacted with their gods. And this is actually a problem that many modern commenters, including this very show, tends to perpetuate. We do focus on the myths and the legends, because let's be honest, they're the most fun. But then we imagine that ancient pagans were worshipping stories in a way different from how modern Christians understand God. One of the slurs often used against modern neo-pagans is that they're worshipping Marvel comic book characters. And it can be hard for people outside the pagan community to see past the stories to the genuinely felt religious sentiments that lay behind that. Of course, let's be honest, some modern pagans really are idiot children looking for something new and rebellious, or something trendy and different. I think that the community really has to acknowledge that. But for those outside this tradition, you need to understand that even if you personally haven't met any genuine pagans, there are definitely people out there whose devotion to the ancient gods is as strong as our modern devotion to the God of Abraham. That this faith is sincerely held and earnestly meant. You may think that these people are being led astray by Satan. And I, who knows, they may be. Let me, let me tell you this. I have had experiences in my life which I believe to show the hand of God acting in my own life. I believe I've felt the guidance of the Holy Spirit and in fact, just last year, I was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe scripture to be the true and authentic word of the one and only true God. But here's the thing. I am ultimately guided by my own impressions in this world. And while I'm firm in my own faith, at a certain point, we all have to realize that demons could be blinding my heart and my eyes. It could be that Ishtar worshippers have the true beat on God. It could be the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Satanists, or whoever. If it was a malicious spirit guiding me to whatever theological conclusions I've come to, then I am not a soul to mock or despise. I'm a soul to be pitied and outreached to. I can't help but think that if I had had these same religious, religious experiences, 5,000 years ago, in an Ishtar-focused context, that would I be just as certain in that faith as I am in my current one? And how would I know the difference on this side of the veil? If the demon was persistent enough, I would be helpless. And what I'm, what I'm getting at with all this is that if you are a pagan listening to this show, of which I know there are at least a few of you, I hope that going through these texts can help you understand the faith you're reviving. For the rest of us, we can listen to these and we can understand that these texts were used by real worshippers, real people whose faith was just as strongly held as yours and mine. Ultimately, we read these to understand. Ancient literary and worship texts cannot bring us closer to objective or scientific truths about the universe. All any of them can do is to help us understand. They can help us understand the lives and minds of people 4,000 years ago. They can help us understand the human condition. And if we let them, they can help us understand and love our neighbors, even across the gulf of incompatible faiths. Anyway, that is more than enough ranting. Let's sing a song of praise to Ishtar. It goes like this. Sing of the goddess, most awe-inspiring goddess. Let her be praised, mistress of the people, greatest of the Igigi gods. Sing of Ishtar, most awe-inspiring goddess. Let her be praised. 
mistress of women, greatest of the Igigi gods. She is the joyous one, clad in loveliness. She is adorned with allure, appeal, charm. Ishtar is the joyous one, clad in loveliness. She is adorned with allure, appeal, charm. In her lips she is sweetness, vitality in her mouth, while on her features laughter bursts to bloom. She is proud of the love charms set on her head, fair her hues, full ranging and lustrous her eyes. This goddess, right counsel is hers. She grasps in her hand the destinies of all that exists. At her regard, well-being is born, vigor, dignity, good fortune, divine protection, whispers, surrender, sweet shared captivation. Harmony, too, she reigns over as mistress. The girl who invokes finds in her a mother. Among women one mentions her, invokes her name. Who is it that could rival her grandeur? Her attributes are mighty, splendid, superb. Ishtar this is, who could rival her grandeur? Her attributes are mighty, splendid, superb. She it is who stands foremost among the gods. Her word is the weightiest, it prevails over theirs. Ishtar stands foremost among the gods. Her word is the weightiest, it prevails over theirs. She is their queen, they discuss her commands. All of them bow down before her. They go to her in radiance. Woman and man fear her too. In their assembly her utterance is noble, surpassing. She is seated among them as an equal to An, their king. She is wise in understanding, reflection, insight. Together they make their decisions, she and her lord. There they sit together on the dais, in the temple chamber, delightful abode. The gods stand in attendance before them, their ears are waiting what those mouths will command. Their favorite king, who their hearts love most, ever offers in splendor his pure offerings. Amiditana offers in plenty before them, his personal, pure libation of cattle and fatted stags. She has asked of An, her spouse, long life hereafter for him, many years of life for Amiditana. Has Ishtar rendered to him as her gift? By her command, she gives him in submission. The four world regions at his feet. She harnessed the whole of the inhabited world to his yoke. Whatever she desires, this song for her pleasure is indeed well suited to his mouth. He performed for her Ea's own words. When he heard this song of her praise, he was well pleased with him, saying, Let him live long. May his own king always love him. O Ishtar, grant long life enduring to Amiditana, the king who loves you, long may he live. Now, it's been a while since we covered the old Babylonian period, but remember that Amiditana was the great-grandson of Hammurabi, putting this particular composition sometime around the 1640s-ish BCE. Though, like many hymnal forms, part of this may have been lifted from other hymns. An interesting thing about the hymns we have, though, is that they don't all involve people praising the goddess. Many are called self-praise poems, and they're written as though it was Ishtar herself speaking. It's deeply unclear, at least to me, who would be reading these and in what context. Would a worship leader be embodying Ishtar as she spoke, or... Was there understood to be some sort of distance as a normal worshipper spoke like this on behalf of the goddess? Anyway, they're, they're not exactly exercises in humility, as we see with this one. I rain battle down like flames in the fighting. I make heaven and earth shake with my cries. The mountains lie low when I tread on the earth. I, Ishtar, am queen of heaven and earth. I am the queen. I cross heaven, 
back and forth as I trample the earth. I destroy what remains of the inhabited world. I devastate the lands hostile to Shamash. I am the most heroic of the gods, she who slays the inhabited world. I draw back on its bridle, he who slays. The moon god begot me. I abound in terror. At the end, if you noticed, she does change grammatical gender, becoming he who slays, as opposed to she who slays. These occasional gender shifts are much debated among modern scholarship, and has led some nowadays to associate Ishtar with the modern transgender movement. I will say, though, that the issues of modern transgenderism are so extremely divorced from the cultural context of ancient Mesopotamia that this is nothing more than cultural appropriation at best, or a severe misunderstanding at worst. But that doesn't mean that role reversal was wholly alien to the ancient world. Indeed, men dressing up as women and women acting like men have been stock features of comedy for as long as we've had the written record. Another item, somewhere between a story and a satirical hymn, goes by the name of Ishtar, Harasser of Men, and begins with the goddess being praised for qualities that we wouldn't usually consider praiseworthy, and ends with a picture of role reversal in society. My lady, let me tell you of your divine valor. Let the chamber resound with sound. May whoever is present listen. O oh, Ishtar, I will praise your capable wisdom. Let him listen. May the one present hear of your valor by the sound. May the clamor call him here quickly. Sing for joy, O Ishtar, let them extol your great deeds. Let them hear this song within. It swells up like a cresting flood at the strength of your virility. He's on the way, that one who had no experience of your power. Your footsteps will guide him till the end of time. The inexpert man will learn from this. He will seek out your doors ere you've laid your hand on him. Your doings are strange, your ways unfathomable. So many are your deeds, what god would not be like you? Overturning the broad seat of emotion and contentment, fickleness and rejection at night are yours, O Ishtar. Discard, disturbance, uncertainty, estrangement, torch of strife and extinguishing conflicts are yours, O Ishtar. Anger, fighting, smolder, then cooling, cursing, holding the tongue are yours, O Ishtar. Doubling tasks and dispersing stores are yours, O Ishtar. Dignity, entreaty, good fortune and divine protection, wealth, abundance, and a bed on the ground are yours, O Ishtar. Blood relative, kinless, foreigner, underling, stranger, to make them brethren is yours, O Ishtar. Bestowing success on a house and the woman who dwells there, causing an angry breach wherever you will, are yours, O Ishtar. Whip, bond are yours, the command of dominance, fear, secrecy, wakefulness, and terror. Preeminence, responsiveness, and wisdom are yours, O Ishtar. Sensuality and foolish things, the best men can do, making a good bedroom at home are yours, O Ishtar. Raising loud battle cries, teeth chattering in fear. Quaffing and playing with hair are yours, O Ishtar. Misogyny, taking goddess and harlot for lover. Making engagements, providing gifts are yours, O Ishtar. Opening the loins to the lover's urge. Twin babies, founding a family, then watching it grow are yours, O Ishtar. Linen, moths, tender lips, the gift of a child, palm fronds, marriage, and success in the bedroom are yours, O Ishtar. Turning man to woman, girl to young boy, you made him play the tune that is yours, O Ishtar. Gathering of woman, forming a circle, luxuriant hair, shouting, How now? Power and intimidation are yours, O Ishtar. Weakness, strength, childbearing, breast, 
infant. Sleep, dreams, and satisfaction in bed are yours, O Ishtar. But then we see a man. Roll reversed, he looks quite different. Yes, to your mockery, shiver at that yes, O Ishtar. You make men obedient with clothes and locks of hair, O Ishtar. The women are feeling over a splendid young man. They are bold with their hair. A man carries a salad leaf in his hand. The woman has a quiver like a man. She's holding a bow. A man carries a hairpin, a mussel shell, kindling, and a girl's harp. Women carry throw sticks, slingshots, and sling stones. A man holds their gear for them. He looks quite different. The reed enclosure is set up for him. They go around outside it. He signals with his hand. Then a woman, dressed like a man, was making a bold move. He got in her way. She points, then he bows twice. Men carry daggers with fluttering wrappings. As lovers, they are frightening to look upon. They shout like flooding water. Go into an angle of the city wall. Satisfy him, sweetie. Preserve a souvenir of him. One of the jesters keeps shouting, Keep clean! Long life! Their backsides are peculiar. What they do is bizarre. They hold spindles. They circle you with demonic desire. The men wear hair combs. Their clothes are pretty as a woman's. They wear pretty hats. And as if renewing every month, your love charms are ready for the whole world to see. Everything goes by having a good time, pouring out quart vessels before you. The drinking tube is conveniently ready, day and night. We get the sense that this sort of poem was meant for a more popular audience, but as mentioned in the early episodes on Ishtar, the goddess of passion attracted a large array of talents. Among those who translate and study Akkadian, one of the most literary accomplished works of the ancient world is a hymn entitled Ishtar, Queen of Heaven. In this work, we see a variety of hymn types being masterfully interwoven. Reusing ancient styles was considered erudite in later Babylonian periods, but whoever wrote this has managed to take some of the most prominent worship forms of the goddess and weave them into something that's simultaneously stereotypical of the genre, and yet also innovative and in its own way brilliant. Now some of that definitely gets lost when it comes into English, but we can hardly lurk at the great works of Ishtar's poetry without including this one. The opening is lost, but we do come in at a good time. There was a man. He made no provision for the capable lady. I was that man who did not speak to Ishtar. She thundered at that man like a storm. She grew full of anger at him. She stole his dignity. She drove off his protective spirit. His god forsook him. His goddess threw him over. The family kept away and did not come near. His lofty stature he bent to a crook. He, let, he leaned his head beside his feet. His city avoided him. His people were afraid of him. He was always walking, hunched over in the outskirts of the city. Nor did hair and beard remain. He had not sought her sanctuary. Indeed, he did not wait upon her. One of furious strength, her established envoy, the owl demon who peers into bedrooms. What a creepy demon. Leaned malignantly through the windows, he heard that man. She cast a chill of fear upon him, so he fell silent. She sent the dusk demon to spy on him. She drove him out of his mind and terrified him. He knew no dignity. His dignity sought another. He kept walking about naked. Her merciless torments were clustered around. Mother, 
infant, spouse, father, no one but she can hold the lead line of heaven. No one but she can rule mountains and seas. No one but she grants kingship, lordship. No one but she rules the inhabited world. No one but she holds the staff of power. No one but she can surround the main house of heaven with excellence. No one but she can make fairest all that exists. No one can sh but she can make make the voice of the people heard. No one but she can complete their pure governance. No one but she can become enraged, relent, have mercy. No one but she can punish, take pity, then forgive. No one but she can bring calm where there is anger. No one but she can lead by the hand out of danger. No one but she can bring back the one who reveres her from the grave. No one but she can revive the dead, restore life. No one but she can grant long life to him who heeds her. No one but she can. Ishtar is mistress of the land of the peoples. She has made everything perfect, completed the rites, and gathered to herself everything. Which God brought forth her sign? Praise her. Her names are surpassing. An, Enlil, and Ea made her important. The Igigi gods cherished her. Her very first name, her great appellation, that her father An, whom she adores, named her of old, is Ninana, Queen of Heaven. Mistress of the inhabited world, who loves the peoples, companion to the sun, fierce in terror, Minuani, exalted in the awesome strength of the young bull, Minuula, her second great appellation, by which her begetter, divine Duranki, made her great, is Neana. She whose strength is sublime, queen of humankind, goddess who is the strength of Anshar, daughter of An, she bears terror, goddess of heaven, impetuous goddess of pity. For a third did Ninshiku, the warrior Ea, in his artful wisdom distinguish her as a name. Zanaru, the capable one, mistress of the four regions, cherished of Dagon. Anunu, creatress of subject peoples, who can turn man to woman and woman to man. She is Namrasit, brightly rising god, father of her favorite brother. She is princess, cherished goddess and mistress, spouse, mistress, beloved, bride of the fierce lion, mistress of Eridu, the Ishtar of An, who dwells in the sanctuary Eana. She is the most lofty one, supreme, sublime, and queen. Sweet are songs of her praise, great her cherishing. The queen of Nippur is sublime and queen. Sweet are songs of her praise, magnificent her cherishing. Who is cherished like the goddess, queen of Nippur, their deity? The seven gods have proclaimed her seven names. May this song be pleasing to you, O Ishtar. May it cease never before you. May it abide at your command. Where there is lamentation, may there be a dirge for you. Where there is happiness, may there be cherishing of you. In the chamber of your rites, may they hail you. Where your rituals are performed, may they address you. In the chambers of the monthly festival, rejoicing in festivity. Listen, O oh mistress, may your mood be joyous. May your heart gladly demand festivity. May the day bring gladness, the night repose. Take your seat in the immensities, O oh Ishtar. May An, Enlil, and Ea be seated with you. Let them drink wine. Drink, drink wine. May your features beam, and may your hearts be glad and be full of rejoicing. Rejoice, O oh Ishtar. May you be joyous. Be at ease, O oh daughter of sin, that they have given you the destiny of divine Doranki, your begetter. Be at ease in Ebar Durgara. Take up in residence your dwelling. 
when you decree destinies with An, Enlil, and Ea, may the destiny of Duranki surpass all. Command the well-being of Uruk. Command a favorable lot for Akkad. May Larsa rise up its head to heaven. May Bad Tabira find repose. May Ur be renewed. And the rest of the prayer is lost but likely ended with a whole bunch of cities and kings of Sumer and Akkad being asked blessings for. Though praise of the gods was a crucial part of ancient religious understanding, no examination of ancient religion is complete without asking the normal people what they want. They express their desires through what's sometimes called prayer and sometimes called magic. Though, in truth, the distinction between the two doesn't seem to really, I mean, have existed at all. These are just more or less elaborate prayers with more or less elaborate magical elements. For example, someone who believed themselves to be the victim of sorcery might pray in the following way as a sort of counter-magic. O oh, pure Ishtar, lofty one of the Igigi gods, who makes battle, who brings about combat, most stately and perfect of goddesses. At your command, O Ishtar, humankind is governed. The sick man who sees your face revives. His bondage is released. He gets up instantly. At your command, O Ishtar, the blind man sees the light. The unhealthy one who sees your face becomes healthy. I, who am very sick, I kneel. I stand before you. I turn to you to judge my case, O torch of the gods. I've seen your face. May my bonds be released. Do not delay. I'm confused and anxious. I live like one who is a bastard. I did what you said to do, O Ishtar. A sorcerer or a sorceress whom you know but I do not know with magic rites of malice and assassination which they've worked in your presence have laid figurines of me in a grave. They've come to assassinate me. They've worked in secret against me. I work against them openly by your sublime command, which cannot be altered, and by your firm assent, which cannot be changed. May whatever I say come true. Let life come forth to me from your pure utterance. May you be the one to say, what a pity about him. O oh, you who are the supreme goddess among gods. For the more prosaic problem of impotence, Ishtar's role as a goddess of passion could be invoked like the following magical spell. Note that in this one as well, the impotence is assumed to be the result of evil sorcery. For what man would the worshipper be if he was just naturally impotent. We can't think like that. It goes, A luminary of heaven, capable Ishtar, mistress of the gods, whose yes means yes, princely one among the gods, whose command is supreme, mistress of heaven and netherworld, ruler of all settlements, Ishtar, at your invocation, all lords are kneeling. I, so-and-so, son of so-and-so, kneel before you. I, against whom sorcery has been done, figurines of whom have been laid in the ground. May my body be as pure as lapis. May my features be as bright as alabaster. Like pure silver, red gold, may I never tarnish. May these seven plants drive away the magic against me. So we'll end for today with the hope that evil magic is warded away from all of us. Ishtar was, and is still, a significant figure. And even looking at all this, which has gone on for quite a while now, this is only to scratch the surface of what was involved in her worship. But hopefully, we have a better sense of the place that this sort of worship held in the ancient mind. Next time, we're going to do more of the same, but with perhaps a more important god. We don't think about him as much, but he was far more important for both government and public life than even Ishtar. So join us next week as we look at the stories and praise of Shamash, the sun. Thank you for listening.